Hello and welcome to the Data Dimensions webinar series brought to you by the Master of Science in Data Analytics and Policy Program and the Johns Hopkins University Office of Advanced Academic Programs. Today's event features a discussion with alumnus Brian Higgins, class of 2011. My name is Peter Huggins and I'm the event producer. Please note today's event will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the Data Dimensions playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function, and we'll answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A portion of the event. With that, I will turn over the event to our moderator, Dr. Colin Paschal, Program Director and Senior Lecturer for the Master of Science in Data Analytics and Policy Program. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for that introduction, and it's great to have all of you um, here this evening for our, our evening edition of Data Dimensions, the first time I think we've had it at, uh, after after working hours, so thank you all for joining. Um, as Peter said, my name is uh, Colin Pascal. I'm the Program Director for the Data Analytics and Policy Program here at Johns Hopkins, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Brian Higgins. Um, Brian graduated with his MA in Government in 2011, so Brian's time at Hopkins actually just barely predates the start of our our um, data analytics and policy program, but Brian um, was one of our the first students to have graduated um, under the instruction of Dr. Jen Bachner, who started up our quantitative method sequence uh, while he was still a student at Hopkins. So very glad to have Brian here. Um, Brian has had a, an interesting career, and he's going to share some insights from that this evening. Um, he is His work has spanned a variety of settings. Um, he's worked as a congressional liaison for the Navy. He served um, as a, he served, he was part of McKinsey and Company doing consulting for public and private clients. And he is now uh, an advisor for the president of the NCAA on business and policy priorities. So Brian's going to share um, some insights into how he, how he's used analytics in his career um, and may have some ideas about career development that he'd like to share with all of you. So I'm going to turn it over to Brian in just a moment. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off, also be in the background, and I will be um, uh, moderating and watching the chat. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to drop those, and then we'll start a discussion afterwards after Brian's had um, an opportunity to share some things. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Brian, for joining us, and I will turn it over to you. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, it's it's a real thrill and an honor to be here. Um, I reached out to Dr. Bachner um, early this year after a career change that had me reflecting on kind of how I how I'd gotten to where I'd gotten and what were the more important things in my life. And everything went back to the experience I had at Hopkins going to the school on Mass Ave at night uh, while I was working in DC with the Navy. And in particular, the two or three classes I had with her where I really learned um, what was possible with data. And that uh, really set my career off in a, in a different direction in many new and exciting ways. And um, I asked her, <laughs> what could I do to return the favor um, and uh, and help the program? So she pointed me to Dr. Pascal and um, that's how this webinar came about. Uh, I'll have an ask at the end, but just to preview it, um, I just started uh, at the NCA. I'm now the Senior Vice President for Business Performance which is a weird uh, made up title, but it basically means I have um, the data and analytics team working for me in addition to a couple of other responsibilities. And we are really excited if you have a thesis idea that has anything to do with college sports or a data analysis project that you need, uh, you need uh, data for, we're open for business. We're really uh, excited to work with students at the NCAA and that's a uh, going to be one of my passion projects. So I'll just lead off with that. Um, hopefully uh, my email address is in the, is in the presentation. Um, I'm going to go through my bio quickly, uh, just to give you a little bit of background and then a couple of kind of observations I've had since. Um, I don't see the shared, oh, there it is. Um, some observations I've had since uh, kind of putting the things into action that I learned um, from Dr. Brockner. And, um, and then we'll, would love to spend at least half the time, if not more, um, with questions and, and hearing what's on your mind. So as uh, Dr. Pascal said, um, I was a submarine officer. The only thing I had ever done with data or Excel was use it to make a seating chart when we would have VIPs visit the uh, submarine. I learned how to do borders on the cells and write people's names uh, to, to mock up the wardroom. 
that was literally the only thing I knew how to do in Excel until uh, starting this program. I then came to DC where I was a congressional liaison and that's where the first sort of inklings of what was possible um, started to come about. One was the Navy paid me to go to Hopkins, which was amazing. But two, we did a whole bunch of, you know, preparation of briefing books when my boss would go meet with folks on Capitol Hill, that we would always get questions, you know, if this bill passes, what's the economic impact going to be on your programs? And it just took me so much time to do any of that until I understood what could be what was possible with data. But it really took off for me after I left the Navy and went to McKinsey. Um, we're constantly getting large data sets and the, the clients I had included, you know, an insurance company, a public sort of housing authority. Um, and I ended up serving the state of Massachusetts for a long time on two public emergencies, um, the most notable of which was the COVID pandemic. So I became basically because there was nobody else that could do it, the uh, the lead data officer for the state's pandemic response. Um, and so every day I briefed Governor Baker on a whole bunch of statistics and ended up, you know, reading academic papers about the vaccines so that we could inform our um, vaccine planning before it rolled out. Just a whole bunch of stuff that I, I all learned how to do here at Hopkins. Um, and frankly, how to be skeptical of the claims uh, that are made in academic papers, because I wrote one and I knew some of them were a little bit uh, on, on thin ice. Um, so that served me very well. And my relationship that I built with Governor Baker there, he's now the president of the NCAA. He brought me here to um, to do analytics and and, um, and uh, strategic planning for the NCAA. So I think the most important skills I learned at Hopkins, and I kind of touched on them a little bit there, is the, the most important one as I look back on it is really research. Like knowing how to find the data you need is, it's much more rare than you think and is an incredible competitive advantage when you can go and uh, and just know where to go. <clears throat> and in some cases, who to call, um, which kind of gets at that last bullet point on how to find the data. Um, then once you have it, being able to turn it, turn the messy data into something decisionable, which is a word we made up at McKinsey, but I think it, it it's helpful. It, it's one thing to have big data and to do a bunch of analysis on it, but what you really need to do is distill the data into the numbers that somebody needs to make a decision. And over time, that person making the decision will be you, right? So figuring out what needs to what needs to, what data you would need to inform that decision starts to happen pretty early in your career, and before you know it, people are rely, relying on you to actually recommend the decisions and then make them. Pretty much because you know how to find the data and how to transform it into what people need. It's an incredible, incredible skill set, and I, you know, credit the ten or eleven classes I took at Johns Hopkins with teaching me both of those things. Less important, but um, but really crucial is some way of coding. Um, I can't remember if we learned uh, SPS or SAS, but we learned one of those uh, fancy statistics programs. Candidly, I can't write a line of code in that program anymore, but what it taught me was how to automate the repetitive tasks of creating those data sets so that as you get more data in, you can get the same output out. And it just saves you so much time in processing that you're able to think more about why you're coding and what analysis you're doing because you're not spending so much time just transforming data. <clears throat> but none of that is really that important if you can't write. <laughs> um, the world works on in written communication still. Um, and one of the things we learned at Hopkins was communicating complex ideas to audiences that didn't have the same technical background in, in whatever you were explaining. I do have a note there that I had to get beaten out of my uh, tendencies was not to write professionally like an academic. Academics write for other academics and there's a lot of value in that. But when you're in uh, the environments that you all are in and um, will continue to be in in your professional lives, decision makers need much more brevity and um, much more clarity than oftentimes academics write for. But when you have the basics of the communication down that writing the thesis and the other projects that you'll do, 
um, it, it's just, it's an incredibly powerful skill. And then the fifth one is the the people I met were, you know, people that worked on the Hill, lobbyists, Republicans, Democrats, people at nonprofit advocacy work groups, people who just really wanted to run for office in their hometown. And they all saw the world differently. And the relationships I build with them, I still stay in pretty close touch with a lot of them. And they helped me to understand the world from a very different perspective than at that time, a naval officer. And those different perspectives are incredibly valuable in getting to the right answers and knowing um, how your decisions are going to affect a whole bunch of people. So that's um, a distillation of what I learned at JHU and, and how I put it together. And these are just some things to consider as you move forward. And I told Dr. Pascal I would go for about 20, 25 minutes, and I'm, I'm going even faster than that. So hopefully you all have questions. Um, if not, I can tell some some funny stories. Uh, SQL and Python are the, the coding languages that businesses and governments are using. Um, so if you're early on in your program and you have the ability to choose what types of languages um, you're going to spend time on, those are the two that I would say are in most use professionally out in the world and will give you the most transferable skills. But as I said earlier, anything you're doing in coding is going to give you the baseline of understanding how to uh, how to code and how to talk to coders, um, which is more important than being able to write the coding yourself. This second one, data processing or data engineering is more important than data science. I had to learn the hard way a few times that <clears throat> just basic descriptive statistics of data are often way more valuable than a fancy predictive algorithm. And um, decision makers in particular really need the data processing and often the best insights come before you get to the data science. I don't mean to diminish the data science, you can do some amazing things, um, but you can really get a lot done in a short amount of time if you just get adept at the data processing. The unfortunate reality is that leaders need PowerPoint or something like it to make decisions. So learning how to make charts and write in short sentences um, is helpful. Um, I fought against that for too long, but um, ultimately I finally embraced it and it's made me a better uh, staff member and it's made me a better leader myself because um, it's a pretty powerful communication tool. Um, at the end of the day, your value as a leader uh, comes from your judgment, the quality of the decisions you make. And it's important to practice making decisions. I think a lot of people um, get to their mid twenties and early thirties, having always been a staff member or always been uh, somebody in those positions and they're not used to making decisions. And at the end of the day, that's what a leader does. They make decisions. Um, so you gotta learn and you gotta practice. And the more practice you can get um, recommending or making decisions yourself, the better off and the better off you'll be when you actually are the only one around that can make the decisions. And it's really important to periodically evaluate honestly how your decisions turned out and use that information to inform uh, and get better. Um, these two quotes here always resonated me resonated with me as somebody who's spent most of their professional life, at least the latter half of my career at this point, um, is data is really important, but this one comes from Admiral Olson, who was, uh, he basically ran all of the special warfare groups. So Navy SEALs, Green Berets and everything, they all answered up to him. And his quote was, when the terrain differs from the map, trust the terrain, right? Like what you see in front of you is, is what's true. It doesn't matter that the map says there's supposed to be a river there. Like you're there, trust what you see and what's happening around you, even if it doesn't check with what your model says should be there. And similarly, Jeff Bezos is fond of saying, when the data doesn't match the anecdotes, trust the anecdotes. Data is incredibly powerful. I wouldn't have been here without it, without what uh, I learned from Dr. Bachner. But at the end of the day, it's just the representation of the world. And what matters is making good decisions in the real world and how they affect real people. And uh, don't, don't ever lose sight of that. And then the final one is just a good life lesson, but um, always be kind. Be kind to your teammates, to the people that work for you, to the people that you work for. Um, it, it's, uh, it seems a little bit, uh, I don't know, trite, but um, all my good relationships that I have today are because the ones where I was kind in the beginning, 
And um, the mistakes I made was when I, I let my temper get the best of me or something like that. And I wasn't kind to people. And um, the further along I go in my career, just kindness and having an open heart are as valuable as any, uh, any skill that, um, that I, that I developed. But um, I'll close with the, the, the box on the right, which I think is the most important thing. Um, please reach out, be in touch. Um, uh, I, when I do these things, generally get one or two emails and, and some of those random connections um, I've been friends with for 10, 15 years. Um, and, you know, people that I've learned a lot from and hopefully have learned a lot from me. Um, if you have any research projects, like I mentioned, um, we would love to work with you um, on that. We're going to start up an internship in the next six months um, to work with our data engineering and data science teams um, and hopefully use data to make better decisions as what's ultimately just a big nonprofit in the education se sector. And um, just uh, deeply grateful for uh, Dr. Bachner and uh, Dr. Pascal and everybody else on the call for um, the experience I had at Hopkins and really looking forward to um, doing whatever small part I can to help you all get as much out of the experience as, as I got. So I was anticipating a bunch of faces on the Zoom um, <laughs> and Colin is a Colin's a great looking guy, but he's all I see. So hopefully looks like we got some stuff coming in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, I will just, uh, I'll ask a question here to start with and then um, I'll I'll monitor the QA and give folks a chance to type your their questions in. I was wondering if you could maybe um, go into a little more detail and some background about some of the some of the work that you did while you were sort of the data lead for the state of Massachusetts during the the COVID um, uh, crisis and kind of what were some of the the objectives that you had um, and while you were in that position and what were some of the things that. Um, uh, that, that you did basically some challenges you kind of overcame as you tried to, you know, get your arms around a very dynamic situation. Yeah. So it started off with like really basic descriptive statistics that were like, how many tests did we run yesterday? How many people tested positive and how many people went to the hospital? And we started this, um, I believe it was March 15th. And so while it felt at the time, like COVID was exploding, we were dealing with numbers that, um, you know, a human being could count without any kind of computers. It was a hundred tests a day and like 15 positives. And like the week before it was maybe 20 tests and two positives. So those felt like massive numbers, but it was just very clear that it was on this crazy upward trajectory. So the department of public health had never dealt with a disease where they needed to report every single day on numbers larger than say a dozen or two. So I had to work with them to process the data in such a way that we could do analysis on it. Because at first they were literally just opening up the database and counting the tests and handwriting the number and putting it in an email. So it was very clear to me that if we went on any kind of trajectory, which turned out, I couldn't have even imagined the trajectory we ended up on. But if we were gonna get into the hundreds and thousands of positive tests a day, that we'd have to systematize it. So at first it was just talking with them about how we could extract the data out of the system in like basically a data table, like a CSV or an Excel file. Um, and then from there, my team wrote some very light code in SQL to process it so that we could automatically put it into a Tableau because the data would come in at say 2.30 in the afternoon and our call with the governor was at four where we had to go over the, day, the data for the day and actually make recommendations about what we were gonna do about it. So it wasn't so much the processing, like anybody could have done what we did. It was the speed at which we had to do it and get, get the data in processed into a digestible format and then use that to make recommendations about you know where should we put our next testing site, for example, um, that you just, you have to have fluency with the data processing to be successful at. As we went forward, we started to do a little bit more advanced things like getting the cases by the zip code where people lived, getting demographic information. Um, over time, we were able to match up the vaccine data and the case data so we could look at underserved areas, um, underserved populations. We got into a lot of um, 
geospatial analysis, right? Where, and this is this is where data is helpful, but not everything. <clears throat> There's one town in Massachusetts, um, New Bedford, if anybody's familiar with it, that had a under you know under vaccinated uh, rate, and we plotted like neighborhood by neighborhood what the vaccination rates were. And there was actually like a, an area when you put it on a map that was, and I'm making this up a little bit, but it was like west and north of two key highways. And somebody from the city knew that's the neighborhood that actually has a lot of, I believe it was Vietnamese immigrants, right? Which wasn't a population that we had worked too much with in terms of language and, you know, going to Vietnamese churches and things like that. We'd largely been focused on Black and Hispanic and Haitian um, immigrants. Uh, and so that kind of how the data and then matching up with somebody that knows the landscape knows was able to like drive insights and decision making of how we could make services available for underserved populations. Um, it was really that was cool. But it was a, a whole host of things like that. Um, and I, I think the, the core takeaway was um, for me that everybody in the Department of Public Health was um, at a minimum had a master's in public health and many of them had PhDs. And they were incredibly knowledgeable in the subject matter, but they just weren't used to working with speed and uncertainty, right? They're used to like, oh man, my uh, my p value is not where I want it to be. I'm gonna I'm gonna wait to submit this for publication until I've got another month worth of data, and uh, we just didn't have that time. So it was a little messier, I think, at times than they would have liked. But um, hopefully, we got to some some better decisions than we would have. Um, certainly, making the best out of bad outcomes. Um, yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you for that, Brian. Um, yeah, yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to follow up and just, just briefly, and then I will turn it over to chat. So again, if you have questions, please go ahead and, and drop those in the chat for us. Um, you know, I wonder, I think the example that you've, um, uh, described here actually, uh, points to a theme that I, I hear pretty commonly when I talk to, to data professionals or people that work in this space is that, it's really more about building like the infrastructure and the managerial aspects around how to ingest the data and process it more so than doing like the fancy, um, you know, the most, the, the, the coolest new machine learning algorithm or something along these lines. What do you recommend, you know, for someone who is trying to sort of build up their skills in this area? Um, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you prepare yourself to be agile like that and, and prepare yourself to work in those kind of like organizational contexts? Because everybody has like the, the technical skills, right? But they don't necessarily have the uh, on the ground experience. I mean, do you have any insights about how folks can think about that now or, or how they can prepare themselves along those lines? Yeah. I mean, I think first and foremost, do what you're doing, like <laughs> take classes and learn, learn some technical skills. Um, secondly, try and try and find ways in the job that you have today, um, to deploy those skills. Right. And I think the reality that, um, Dr. Paspo is kind of hinting at is except for companies that sort of started after the internet, like Google or Tesla or something like that, the companies that most of the companies that exist in the world, their data is incredibly messy. Like I had a, I had a client that made, um, fancy screws, like the type of screws that would attach a car engine to the chassis of a car or, um, you know, hold your iPhone in place, but don't um, take up, you know, much space in the thing, whatever. And their data was so bad, they actually didn't know if they'd ever design, like when they'd get a request to design something, they didn't know if they'd ever design something with the same dimensions. And there's only so many dimensions to a bolt, right? It's like how long it is, what material it is, how thick it is, and what's the thread count. But they didn't track any of that for like, 50, 60 years of designing bolts. So they couldn't do any kind of analysis. Now that's an extreme case, right? But when you actually get into your, whether it's you know your congressional office or your nonprofit or whatever, you'll see how messy the data is in real world, in the real world. And trying and just struggling to get workarounds of, geez, how can I join this field to that field? Will really give you an insight into how the very deep technical folks work. I mean, the reality is if you want to work in, you know, data infrastructure and like actually manage like a cloud system or something like that, like, I mean, I'm sure we are learning more advanced stuff than I did when I was at Hopkins over a decade ago, but like you're learning to use data as a manager, as a policymaker, as a, you know, a government person or nonprofit person. And so 
learning to talk with the deeply technical folks, whether they're a vendor or, you know, the systems administrator or folks like that, it makes you a so much better manager than learning how to do it yourself because you're not going to have the time to learn it as deep as they can, but to be able to interface and what we, the word we'd use in McKinsey is translate between the deep, deep, deep technical folks and the folks that, and this will get to, I think, Dr. Bachner's second question about the folks that lack the technical background. In this case, we're talking about technology background, but you know, most of it is the statistical background, right? Like people don't understand what uncertainty is. They don't understand, um, you know, why you use a certain, um, why you certain use a certain exponent to use a curve that you're projecting out or things like that. And um, so let me, let me pause here. Does that answer the question, Dr. Pascal? Is that like learning how to, the basics of what can be done so that you can speak with the technical folks is um, to me, the most valuable skill. And um, it makes you a better manager and better decision maker and policy maker. Yeah, that, that definitely was what I was getting at. I think that um, it's underrated the importance of doing that translator or that, or that liaising between people who are um, more technical and who are more policy sort of substantively oriented. That's a real skill set in itself. Um, you know, the really super technical people don't always have um, that ability to do that translation, or at least it's not what they're inclined to do. So that's definitely they're, important. They're not. Um, and I know yeah. this is not a business school class, but I had a, I had to spend like a couple weeks with one data science team that I had one time to constantly reinforce the difference between revenue and profit, right? And so if you're not in the business, like revenue is the money you take in and profit is what's left after covering your costs. And these data scientists like didn't care to even know the difference, right? They were just off writing code and they wanted to like boost their R square valued or whatever we were using to measure the model. And they couldn't give a rip about the actual business implication of the difference between revenue and cost. And that's where folks like you come in. Um, and so getting to Dr. Bachner's question, um, some of the, have I found a challenge to commit statistical findings to high level decision makers? Like a thousand times, yes. Um, it's the hardest part of, of the job. And I think <laughs> the gaps in understanding, it depends on the audience, right? So um, I don't know how familiar you are with um, Governor Baker in Massachusetts, but he's sort of like, famously like nonpartisan and loves data and had been the CEO of a health insurance company. And so he has no statistical background of any kind, but wants to learn and would be willing to listen and stuff like that. I had other bosses, I had other clients that didn't want to learn and just wanted it to be very simple and very upfront and like, you know, just tell me what the answer is. So I think the first and most important lesson I learned and the hard way a couple of times, I don't want to <laughs> impart that I, I, this came naturally to me is like, know your audience and know how much of a tolerance they'll have for the kind of wind up explanation and, and, and like why you chose a more complex method than just addition or subtraction. Um, Cause there's often, there's always a good reason, right? You should start with the simplest one, but very often that's not going to get you the right answer. Um, the other one I would say is, know the data inside and out because decision makers, and I think I notice this most with folks on, on the Hill, elected representatives, particularly the, the good ones that get deep in policy, they'll test you by asking hard questions, even if they're not necessarily related to the thing that you're trying to convey, just to see if you understand the underlying data. So go in with a deep, deep, deep understanding of all of the data that went into it and be able to um, you know, answer what might feel like unrelated questions, but just because you've, you're have you familiar enough. And if you don't know, particularly in your early interactions with them, say, I don't know, I'll get back to you on that right away. Don't make it up. Um, because over time, I was able to build trust, you know, particularly with Governor Baker, that like, I wasn't BSing him. And then I had less of a burden to get him on the statistics. But there were definitely some times when I brought him some stuff and he was like, look, I don't understand this graph. There's no way the public's gonna understand this graph. You gotta make it simpler. Um, um, so hopefully that answers that. Yeah, um, I, would, I would just comment, you know, my experience with working on with Hill type staffers and the occasional lawmaker is that, again, they may not have deep technical, technical expertise, 
but they're politicians for a reason and they're very good at judging credibility and they're very good at thinking about the implications of how how the information is going to be communicated in a way that the public and other stakeholders are going to interact they're very tactical thinkers and so being yeah. able to to prove that you that you know what you're talking about is really important in those contexts and so, i'm, I'm glad you brought that up it, yeah. another one that's sort of related to that and my last point on the like diverse networking they might seem like the most the biggest simpletons in the world right but they bring a value and a view of the world that is good and is adding and they're going to make they're going to get you to a better policy answer and trust that when they're asking those questions they're doing it for a very good reason and your reaction shouldn't be and i made this mistake a few times oh this dummy just doesn't get it they don't understand what it, this is our square value is unbelievable how could it how could the model be wrong like trust that when they're asking those hard questions they're doing it for a very good reason and um answer them in good faith because they're usually um, seeing around a corner that you don't see, and it's really beneficial that they're asking hard questions. Yeah, totally agree. Um, I wanted to uh, move to James's question. Um, he asked it a few minutes ago about um, how the data focus degree from JHU makes you competitive against MBA holders when getting into consulting work. Um, and maybe you could just talk a little bit about sort of the, the pathways to going into uh, consulting that, that you see for folks that might be graduating from our program? Yeah, so in full transparency, I actually did get an MBA after this because of an insane loophole in the Navy's like degree completion thing. Um, so having said that, I just didn't want you to like find me on LinkedIn and say, that guy said that JHU is a great way into consulting. He didn't mention he had an MBA. It actually, <clears throat> it actually is for a few reasons. One, since I started consulting in 20, I guess I got my offer in 2014. Um, so that's a long time ago in terms of like how the business world views data and how frankly governments and nonprofits view data. They have really pivoted away, not abandoned entirely, but pivoted away from uh, MBAs and pivoted towards quantitative backgrounds, right? So this is everything from like undergrads, data science, or like electrical engineering or things like that, um, masters in programs like this, the quantitative component of the job has gotten so, so, so much bigger to the point where my first year there, um, I, I was still bad with Excel, but I knew SQL. And somebody saw me hammering around in Excel and was like, you're going to get fired unless you learn how to do something more efficient than what you're doing. So I was like, well, okay, well, screw it. I'm just going to use SQL. And um, because that meant that I could open data sets that were too big for Excel. I think Excel tops out at like 250,000 rows or something, which made me like an analytics whiz, right? Nowadays, like most of the people we get out of undergrad have some kind of STEM background. It's just become way more popular. Um, so it's, it's increasingly important <clears throat> that everybody have that sort of quantitative analysis skills, which means that it, they, they're, they're way less interested in hiring folks from a like, uh, well, <laughs> I was in the Navy and I went to um, I went to business school and I read a bunch of case studies and now here I am, right? Um, so it, in general, um, they're really focused on quantitative stuff. The only caveat is like for whatever, for cyclical reasons, now is not a great time to break into consulting. Like all the professional services firms um, are struggling a little bit because they overhired a little bit too much coming out of COVID. Um, so again, send me an email and I'm happy to talk to you about like the career path to consulting. If that's something you're interested in, I'm also happy to tell you why I left and, um, you know, but it's uh, the, the quantitative background and the degree that you're getting, particularly now that you have the like data degree and not mine, which was like government with political communications. And I took every data focus class I could, but it ultimately amounted to maybe three classes with Dr. Bachner and one class on statistics in the econ department that almost, I almost failed out of the program because it was like all Greek letters. Um, but now that you have a real quantitative program, I think it, it, it's a great way uh, to get in. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that. I think that's a good insight. I mean, I think, um, you know, one observation, if I may, is that you're, you're probably not going to like be able to totally out tech everybody else on the job market these days because there are some ability, there are some folks who are so teched up. But I think a nice portfolio, a set of work 
that demonstrates these like ability to like frame research questions and present information in a straightforward, digestible way. Um, that might actually be like the most job relevant thing that you can really get out of the program. Yeah. I say this as an academic who has never had a real job, but it's <laughs> my impression from talking to folks like Brian, that seems like a, you know, really the way, the way to go. So no, a hundred percent, particularly, particularly if you want to be in a, in a, a non-technical leadership position, right? Um, the, it really, it really comes down to being able to speak tech, but also being able to speak the. And when, when I, <clears throat> excuse me, when I use the word business, I don't necessarily mean a for-profit like corporation. Hmm. I mean, like if you're a, if, you know, if you're a nonprofit get an advocacy group, your business is the advocacy that you're doing, and, but you still have to worry about fundraising and payroll and meeting objectives and deadlines and everything else. So when I use the term business, that's what I mean. Um, and maybe that'll kind of be a quick brief into the, the first question in the chat, which is, can I talk about how we use data at the NCAA? So not as much as we'd like, which is why I have a job and why we're trying to build this out and do more. But a good example is um, our ticket prices. Um, we sell tickets to um, you know the NCAA basketball tournament, March Madness. We sell tickets to... Um, much less uh, famous and less well attended um, tournaments, but they're all championships for our student athletes. And the number one thing that our student athletes want in the championship is to play in front of large crowds. They love it. It's a great experience. It's great exposure. And what we did um, for big project a couple months ago was analyze our ticket prices versus what the tickets were selling for on the open market and what percentage of those um, events were sold out. And so by combining those three data sets, we were able to see that there were certain groups of tickets, particularly the better you know, seats closer to the court or the field for certain events that were severely underpriced. And because of that, we were leaving millions of dollars in revenue that could go back to our student athletes um, in the form of better experiences. But there were also championships where the tickets were actually overpriced and we could afford to reduce those so that more people in the community that were near the events could come in and, you know, bring their kids and stuff like that and have it be a, you know, a $20 Saturday afternoon as opposed to a $75 or $80 family event. And so taking our proprietary data, comparing it with public data and using that to inform ultimately the committees of coaches um, who actually approve the ticket prices. To, to make a case as to why it was actually in their interest to raise prices, if that's what the data showed, and in other cases to lower prices um, because it was actually um, screening out some folks who would otherwise attend the events. So that's kind of an example. Um, we're doing a little bit more advanced data science stuff to plan, to plan the flights in March Madness. So between the men's and the women's tournament in March, if you all are sports fans, um, we have something like 120... No, now with the other tournaments, close to 200 teams that need to get from their campus to where they're playing either Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, and they don't find out where they're going until Sunday night. So you can imagine the planning that itinerary is a huge cognitive load. Right now we have one literal genius that does it all in her head, um, but we need to both for operational risk in case she's to ever get sick or and also to make it so that she can actually sleep at some point in the month of March, we need to use data to uh, make it a little bit easier to, to make those flight uh, pattern decisions. So those are a couple of examples of how we've used, we use data at the NCAA. And hopefully if you're sports fans, you'll notice more coming soon. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, I, I want to, in the interest of time, make sure that we get to the questions that uh, everyone has posed here. So let's, um, I'm just going in order here. So we'll go to Joseph Wank Winkleman, who asks, um, what specific characteristics and skills would make a candidate, uh, would make a candidate for a data analysis internship at the NCAA very well suited that enables them to stand out from other applicants? And I guess in general, we could you know, generalize and say, what are some things that you can really sell um, uh, when you're doing your job applications? We've talked about a few things already, but maybe we could just review and, and summarize. Yeah, I would say de demonstrated um, demonstrated technical experience. Um, if you if you were going to be in the like data and analytics group, would be important. Um, you know, 
some sort of uh, validation that you've worked with data, large data sets and like can code a little bit, um, but it's not like you're gonna, you gotta be an expert coder. Um, I think some sort of interest and energy for um, college sports, particularly for what we're driving at now, um, women's sports and sort of not football and basketball. Football and basketball are great, but they're generally doing quite well on their own. And we're really committed to making sure that the other sports um, get a little bit more attention and um, we invest a little bit more in their growth. Um, and um, some experience, I think, in um, you know how you've used data to make decisions, right? So the, the stuff that we've talked about. Um, but frankly, we don't have the we don't have a lot of applicants yet, so um, I'll uh, <laughs> I'll definitely be sure to email Dr. Pasco when we get the uh, when we get the um, program up and running. And um, yeah, I think th those are those are big ones. Um, to the extent that you are a good uh, good good written communicator, I do find that um, deep 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 technical folks um, often struggle um, with the written language and, um, you know, particularly in a remote world, it doesn't have, you don't have to be Hemingway, but, um, you know, figuring out, you know, what needs to go on a text, how to write an email that conveys your point with less than 4,000 words and stuff like that are all really important skills. Yeah. The, the, the worst thing that you want to get when you're working with people and, and, but something you will remember it was when you get that first TLDR uh, response to something you write. <laughs> um, you never forget it, but it's a good it's a good lesson when you when you do when you do get that once in a while. Um, uh, when, moving on to, go I ahead. had a boss one time that said in 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 an email. First of all, picture that your boss is reading your email on your phone on on their phone, right? And because of that, you should never write a paragraph in an email that's more than two sentences. Um, so. And always bold what the ask is in case they only look at it for 10 seconds. So um, at the, pick up <laughs> a the little phone. bit of a side. I mean, pick, up, pick up the phone. If you have something that complex that needs, yeah. <laughs> you know, needs to be communicated, phone is you still have to do it sometimes. Um, talking about the Kirsten Mackler's question now, um, I'm just going to read it here. I think we often see how data can be used to confirm positions and ideals that we hold, especially when communicating data or providing visualizations. How do you navigate using data to support your positions you advocate for versus trying to make sure that you are getting a more complete and objective picture? So uh, yeah, an interesting question about how do we sort of justify our own conclusions and um, actually use data to inform our decisions rather than to lead us to the things that we wanted to believe in the first place. Yeah, Kirsten, that is an awesome, awesome question and something that um, you got to ask yourself every day. What what are you doing? Why are you providing this data, right? So I'll use a few examples um, from COVID where um, where this, this came up, right? So when we were doing the vaccine rollout, um, at first, it was not going well. The shots that we had were not getting into arms. And governor asked me to figure out like why what is going on like why aren't we getting them in arms and in that case i was going and combing through the data looking for who we gave the shots to and where which percentage of them had been like administered so we could see like which types of people weren't getting the shots in arms in that case i really was trying to get to use a more complete and objective picture as to what was going on because we didn't know when we were trying to answer it. There were other times where, um, you know, the, the governor who's a public facing politician was advocating for a position, right? And the charge was go make the best argument we can with data to convince people why the vaccines are a good idea or that Massachusetts is actually doing a good job with the vaccine rollout, because eventually we got to be number two in the country. Um, go make an argument that, um, you know, we're doing better than other states in terms of serving disadvantaged populations, but show that there's a real opportunity to do more and tell me, you know, what those things should be. 
So I think that the most important thing in general is to like truly understand what what your decision maker is trying to do. Are they trying to make an argument or are they trying to develop a policy and get to the right answer? It is really, I think, something that I struggle with all the time and um, I have to check myself on every day is understand that understand what your role is and play the role that you need to play. Don't get caught up in the, the, the trap I fall into personally is I get attached to my argument and I'm in the role of helping my boss make a better decision, but I get attached to the position I want him to take. And I end up not doing as good a job as an impartial analyst because I've tied myself to the argument, right? Like it's the boss's job to make an argument in that case, right? It's the boss's job to make the argument. It's my job to help him make the argument about the right thing. But too often I fall into the trap of getting attached to a particular policy decision and then not taking the wrong side of your question. Because it's really easy when you get into the heat of these things. And frankly, like you spend six or eight days on an analysis of something really complex and you develop opinions on it to not get attached to a particular position. Um, and I think where, you know, sometimes where I've, where I've slipped is where I've gotten too attached to a position and didn't see some, you know, piece of data that made my position less strong, or I didn't bring it forward to the boss. Like, Hey, you know, this, this is what I think is the right answer, but here's the data that would, you know, if you thought it was the wrong answer, here's the data you'd use to support that argument. Um, but the question you ask is like really, really insightful as to um, kind of when you get into a little bit more senior roles, um, uh, one, you know, one of the questions you gotta always ask yourself. Great, well, thank you for that answer, Brian. And thank you um, uh, just for your time this evening. I don't think we have any more questions, so I'll just, vamp here for a minute if anybody has any last minute questions feel free to drop it in but um yeah i i'm just very appreciative of the insights you've had about um career readiness of strategies for how to communicate with decision makers and um sort of actionable insights that we can draw from data so um seeing no more questions i think i'll go ahead and, and just wrap up but uh, again extend my thanks and um if you have any other final thoughts i'm happy to to hear those otherwise thank you for your time and um, I hope that, you know, many of you will take up, take Brian up on his um, invitation to connect. I know that we will have a recording of this presentation that we'll post to all of our social media and it'll be available. So you'll be able to find his email address and um, review the answers again and think about what he said today. So um, with that, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Unless Brian, you have any, any final thoughts you wanted to share? No, just no. Uh, say thank you again, um, especially to Dr. Bachman, who, um, was on. So it was just a, it's an incredible experience and um, thanks for the opportunity to, to speak. And I really hope to, to meet some of you soon. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all. We'll go ahead and, and uh, close for the evening. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, close the room here and log out and uh, hope to talk, talk with many of you again soon and see you at the next edition of Data Dimensions, which will be later in October. And will be a very interesting talk having to do with privacy and ge geospatial information um, by one of our faculty members, Claire Kelling, who is an adjunct who's going to talk to us in October. So uh, watch your social media feeds and your inboxes for that. And we'll see you then. Can I join that one? Sounds Absolutely. good. <laughs> Absolutely. You're, you're, you're invited, Brian. 100%. Thanks. Okay. Good evening, all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.